Hi, and welcome back. Now that we have an understanding of statistical significance, we need to think about measures of association and how measures of association help us understand sort of the predictive ability of an independent variable predicting the values of a dependent variable. And if the level of measurement is correct, for example, if we have ordinal by ordinal level relationships, how we can use those measures of association to establish the directionality of the relationship. So let's begin. We're going to talk about a variety of things today. We're going to talk about what is a measure of association. We're going to talk about how to interpret correlation coefficients. And then we're going to look at nominal level association, ordinal association. And finally, we're going to look at how everything that we've talked about up to this point helps us classify a wide variety of hypotheses. What is association? A measure of association or a correlation coefficient is a single number that summarizes the shared relationship between two variables. There's a wide range of measures available for describing how strongly two variables are related. Some differ in their basic approach, but even when the basic approach is similar, the measures may differ with respect to the type of data for which they're appropriate and their computational details. This means, however, that different measures of association are not directly comparable. We should never compare different relationships that we've observed in different tables if they're using different measures of association. We always have to use the same measure of association. Measures of association are going to give us both the strength or degree of the relationship and, as I said previously, if we have ordinal by ordinal level relationships, it'll also give us the directionality of the relationship. When we interpret a correlation coefficient, as a general rule of thumb, you can use sort of this table here to develop an understanding of the strength of a relationship. A correlation coefficient is going to be a value that ranges from zero, no relationship between the two variables, to one, perfect relationship. And it, as, as you look down this table, you see, you know, when you get a coefficient of zero, there's no relationship. 0 0.1 to 0 0.9, very weak relationship, etc. Through 0 0.6 to, very, to 0 0.8, very strong relationship. But beyond that, I think we need to worry because the closer we get to one, the closer we get to perfect prediction. Perfect prediction is actually a bad thing because, of course, we would get perfect prediction if we measure the same variable with two different instruments that measure the same property. For example, you could imagine a perfect correlation between your height in centimeters and your height in inches, or your weight in pounds and your weight in kilograms, etc. And what's happening is we're just measuring the same property, height or weight, using different instruments. So we don't want perfect correlation. What we want is typically somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0 0.8. A word of advice when you interpret a correlation coefficient, a weak correlation coefficient that is statistically significant is important. So let's say hypothetically we found we had a correlation of 0 0.09, which on this table would suggest that it's a very weak relationship. However, if it's statistically significant, all that might imply is that there's a lot of the variation in the dependent variable still being explained by other unobserved variables. Let's start with nominal level association. And with nominal level association, we're going to look at the degree of a relationship that we have when we have one or both of our variables being nominal. And if one or both of our variables are at the nominal level, that means that our relationship cannot, by definition, have a direction. There's no directionality to the categories of a nominal variable. Nominal variables have no inherent direction to their relationships. And this means we have to look at the cross tab. So depending on what our prediction is, it should show up in the cross tabulation. And as your hypotheses will be based on these categories, just look to see if your predicted category of the dependent variable is in fact more likely to occur in the category of the independent variable that you've indicated. The measures of association will explain how different categories of the independent variable predict different categories of the dependent variable. And so, for example, let's say that we wanted to predict which party someone voted for in the 2005 British election. And they could have voted Labour, Conservative, Liberal, or other. There is variation in this variable, but we want to use an independent variable to help us predict the variation in this dependent variable. Let's start with a basic measure of association, lambda. Lambda is what's called a proportionate reduction in error measure. And I think it provides a fairly intuitive approach to measuring association. It involves asking, how much does knowing the values of cases on the independent var variable help us improve our ability to predict their values on the dependent variable? Now, if they're perfectly related, knowing a case value on the independent variable will allow us to perfectly predict its value on the dependent variable with 100% accuracy. And if they're unrelated, knowing the value of a case on the independent variable will be of no help at all in predicting its value on the dependent variable. 
If they're partially related, what we're going to get is a correlation coefficient that's somewhere between 0 and 1. Now, how this works is lambda looks at the number of errors you would make when you guess the values of the dependent variable by itself. If you took your best guess, if you randomly selected one of the observations, one of these people from the 2005 British election said, I'm going to take my best guess as to who they voted for, you would guess the modal category, which in this case is labor. 443 of 930 voted labor, which is the mode. It's not the majority, but it's the mode. Now, this means that 930 minus the 443 correct guesses you make would mean that you'd make 487 errors. With the introduction of an independent variable, such as religion, and let's say we have categories of Catholic and Protestant, what we want to know is how much or by what proportion we improve our ability to guess the party that someone voted for when we know their religion. So if we knew that someone was Catholic and we chose the mode of Catholic labor, and we have 530 Catholics minus the 350 that we're going to correctly guess, we would still make a number of errors. We'd make 180 errors. And similarly, if we guess Protestant, we have 400 Protestants, and the mode of this category is conservative, and 188 voted conservative, then we'd still make 212 errors. And so what happens is when you add the errors that you make for the values of the independent variable, you see that we get 392 errors. And with that, we can calculate the proportionate reduction of error. It's just the total amount of errors we would make minus the number of errors that we would make if we knew how many error, if we knew the categories of the independent variable and how many errors are produced, divided by the total number of errors. And you can see that we get a coefficient of 0 0.195. The great thing about lambda is this has a nice, natural, intuitive interpretation. This tells us that we've reduced the amount of error we make guessing the values of a dependent variable through the introduction of the independent variable by 19.5%. Easy as pie to understand, right? Well, there's a problem. And the problem is this. Despite its intuitive calculation and interpretation, lambda will always calculate to zero if you have the same modal category of the dependent variable across the categories of the independent variable. So for example, look at this table which looks at satisfaction with democracy in Canada with an independent variable having divided our sample into those who live in Quebec versus the rest of Canada. And as you look down the columns, you realize that the mode is the same for both those in the rest of Canada who say that they are fairly satisfied and in Quebec who say that they're fairly satisfied. Now, when you do the calculation, we know that with the dependent variable, if we chose the mode, we'd make 420 errors. But using this calculation, if we took the 288 of those in Quebec and subtract the 159 errors and add that to the 671 in the rest of Canada and subtract the 380 errors we make, we're still making 420 errors. And therefore, the calculation would be 420 minus 420, which is going to give us a numerator of zero. And therefore, the calculation is zero. Now, as you look at this table, it does look like those in Quebec are less satisfied with the way that democracy works in Canada. And you can see that, first of all, in the first category, not at all satisfied. There is a difference in the percentage, the 6.4 in the rest of Canada versus 10.4 in Quebec. So there, there's an observable difference. There's more Quebecers who are not at all satisfied. There's also more Quebecers who are not very satisfied. You can see in the 18.78 versus the 25%. And finally, there's not as many Quebecers who claim that they're very satisfied. So there do seem to be differences, and differences that we probably would have predicted if our hypothesis was those in Quebec are less likely to be satisfied with the way that democracy works in Canada than those uh, outside of Quebec. The cross tab seems to validate our hypothesis, but our measure of association calculating to zero is problematic for us. And, and it's for this reason, this problem with lambda, where if we have the same modal category across the categories of the independent variable and the value of the dependent variable, that we can't use lambda ever. Despite its intuitive in interpretation, we can never use lambda. So instead, we're going to use measures such as Kramer's V or phi. And Kramer's V is based on the chi-square statistic, as is phi. And it's just the square root of chi-squared divided by n times k minus 1. And k, in this case, is the number of categories. It's either the number of categories in the independent variable or the number of categories in the dependent variable, whichever is smaller. And a special case of Kramer's V is phi when either your independent variable or your de dependent variable or both are dichotomous because if the smallest 
number of categories in either your rows or columns equals 2, you're going to be left with n times k minus 1, which is going to be n times 2 minus 1, or n times 1. So phi is just a modification of Kramer's v. Now, going back to this original table, we had a calculated chi-square of 18.16, and with our, that was a statistically significant chi-square. And when we do the phi calculation, so we take that chi, calculated chi-square and take the square root of chi-square divided by our sample size, in this case 959, we get a phi of 0 0.138. Or there's a weak relationship between the region in, of Canada in which someone resides and their satisfaction with the way that democracy works. Fantastic. Lambda did not show us this relationship. Okay, so let's move on. And we're going to move on to ordinal level relationships. And with ordinal level relationships, now we have directionality to our measures. Because our ordinal categories are ordered, they increase in some property without a known dis distance between the, the categories, we can use our measures of association based on the linked order between the variables. When increasing categories of an independent variable generally predict increases across the categories of the dependent variable, we can say that our relationship is positive. For example, let's say we had an independent variable that was education. We know that someone with a BA has more education than someone with more, some college, etc. We aren't exactly sure how much more. And say we had a dependent variable, like a strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. And you can imagine if I was predicting increasing levels of education, predicting increasing agreement with whatever statement. That would be a positive relationship. A negative relationship would be if I were to predict increasing categories of my independent variable of education, predicting decreasing agreement. The more education, the more some disagrees. And this is based on the idea of looking for what's called agreement versus inversion. So here's, here's a couple real simple tables. Imagine I have a table that's just categorizes low, medium, high in the independent variable, low, medium, high in the dependent variable. We get perfect inversion where all observations on the independent variable, in this case 15 observations, occur in the same low category of the dependent variable. And then the 8 in the medium category for the independent variable also show up as in the medium category of the dependent variable, etc. Perfect inversion is where our high category of our independent variable is predicting all the low categories of the dependent variable. Now, a good way to look at an ordinal level, level relationship is with a measure of association such as uh, Goodman and Kruskal's gamma, which provides a ratio of the agreements that we get relative to the inversions that we get. Okay, so here's how you would calculate gamma. What we need to know is understand the chance of drawing what's called a positive versus a negative pair, or an agreement versus an inversion. We have to count the total number of positive and negative pairs. So we would be looking at a cross-tabulation, like this one, someone's support for free enterprise by their ideological self-placement. So to compute the positive pairs, begin in the cell in the upper leftmost corner and multiply it by the sum of the frequencies in all cells below and to the right. And to compute negative pairs, begin with the cell in the upper rightmost corner and multiply it by the sum of the frequencies in all cells below and to the left. And you're going to do this for every cell. So you can see that four cells are going to have positive pairs. Excellent. So let's, let's walk through the calculation. And what we're going to do is we're going to assign row numbers and column numbers to help make this calculation a little bit easier. Okay, so take a look at here's our Here's our table. We've added row numbers and column numbers. So for example, R1C1 is the intersection of low support for free enterprise and left ideological self-placement. And as I said, the positive pairs are all going to be below to the right. And in this case, they're going to be cells that are labeled R2C2, R2C3, R3C2, and R3C3. And if we're looking at R2C2, for example, the only positive pair for R2C2 below and to the right is R3C3. So we take our origin cell and multiply it by the sum of the paired cells. So in the first case for R1C1, we have 164 observations. And then we multiply it by the sum of R2C2, R2C3, R3C2, and R3C3, which respectively are 312, 135, 326, and 20. And when you make that calculation, you get 162,852. Now we're going to continue this pattern for all of our positive pairs. So we're going to move to R1C2, R2C1, R2C2, get all of our positive pairs. And you can see that when we do this, this calculation adds up to 366,081. 
So we have 366,081 positive pairs. That's our total number of agreements. Now we're going to work in the top right-hand corner and look for inversions or negative pairs. So when we start with R1C3, we're looking for all those cells below and to the left. So for example, R2C1, where there's 69 observations, is one of the cells below and to the left of R1C3, as is R2C2, R3C1, and R3C2. And so we would have the numerical value in R1C3, that's our origin cell, 75 observations, times 69 plus 312 plus 68 plus 326, all of its negative pairs. And we're going to continue this pattern all the way down through R2C2, which only has one negative pair, which is R3C1. All right, now when you add all these up, you get the total number of negative pairs, which is 169,932. All right, so once you have the number of agreements or positive pairs and the number of inversions or negative pairs, we can do the ratio. And we do this using the gamma formula, agreements minus inversions over agreements plus inversions. And so you can see 366,081 minus 169,932 divided by 366,081 plus 169,932. And that gives us a gamma calculation of 0 0.366. So we have a moderate, almost a strong relationship between someone's ideological self-placement and their support for free enterprise. There's a problem with gamma. The problem with gamma, uh, which we interpret as being a moderate to strong positive relationship between the ideological self-placement and support for free enterprise, and positive, by the way, keep in mind, means that as values of our independent variable are increasing or traveling along the x-axis, values of our dependent variable are, are also increasing as we travel along our y-axis. We have positive pairs predominating, gamma being positive. Uh, but gamma is literally interpreted as being the probability of correctly predicting the order of a pair of cases on the dependent variable once we know their order on the independent variable. Here's the rub. Ignoring ties. So gamma is ignoring those cells, for example, if we're in R1C1, immediately to the right and immediately below. It's ignoring those observations. And as a result, gamma always overinflates the amount of association between the two variables. So as a result of this overinflation, it's preferable to use a more conservative measure such as tau b or Summers d. In the previous slide, for example, tau b calculates as 0.23, which is a moderate relationship, but it's not quite as strong a moderate relationship. Gamma of 0.366 is almost a third larger than our tau b of 0.23. Okay, so here's what we've learned. I want you to think about this because if you combine what you learn in this particular video with the previous video, you can interpret a wide variety of hypotheses. And so as you look at this hypothesis classification template, you can see that just knowing the chi-square statistic and Kramer's V and its derivative phi in that special case, in addition to tau B and Summers D, we can interpret a wide variety of hypotheses so long as we don't have interval level variables to deal with. So for the remainder of the course, we're going to look at those interval level variables, but keep in mind that any interval level variable can be recoded. It can be recoded as a dichotomy, right? Those who make more than $50,000, those who make less, or it can be recoded as an ordinal level, right? Those who make on the low end of the spectrum, those in the middle end of the spectrum, and those on the high end of the financial earning spectrum. A lot of times when you think about how to test hypotheses, you can reconceptualize your hypotheses so it fits on all of these tests that you know up to this point. Okay, so here's what we've covered. We've covered measures of association, how to interpret correlation coefficients, we talked about nominal association, ordinal association, and we dealt with the classification of hypotheses. Great job, students. Now that we have an understanding of nominal and ordinal association and the chi-square statistic, we're ready to move on to interval-level association. First up, t-tests. We'll see you soon.